This is Cashflow Ninja, episode 96, with Chris Martinson. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Now, here is your host, MC Laubscher. Hello everyone, MC Lobster here and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. I have a very important episode for you today because the next 20 years will be completely different than the previous 20 years. The decisions that you make today are critical. We have unsustainable trends in the economy, energy and the environment. Our global financial system is structurally terminal. Our global monetary system is designed to enable institutionalized theft and impoverish the majority of people on this planet. Just take a look at the system that is built on debt. Governments are in debt and completely broke. Individuals and families have never been in so much debt in history and are dependent on more debt just to survive. We are so dependent on oil with no strategic plan in place to become less dependent on oil. And we've been destroying our environment, regardless of what your view is on global warming or the new speak term climate change. I think that we can agree that we've done severe damage to our environment and not only have done damage, but irreversible damage like Fukushima. But as always, there are three sides of a coin, as Robert K. Saki would say, heads, tails, and the edge. With challenges comes unbelievable opportunity. You can look at these old collapsing systems and be depressed or pessimistic, or look at all of this and see the most amazing time to be alive with the most unbelievable opportunities right in front of us. My guests today have identified all of these problems and challenges that we face and offers a positive vision and approach of how our lives can become more balanced, resilient, and sustainable. My guest today is Chris Martinson. Chris is an economic researcher and futurist specializing in energy and resource depletion and co-founder of PeakProsperity.com along with Adam Taggart. As one of the early econobloggers who forecasted the housing market collapse and stock market correction, Chris rose to prominence with the launch of his seminal video seminar, The Crash Course, also published in book form. It's a popular and well-regarded distillation of the interconnected forces in the economy, energy, and the environment, the three E's as Chris calls them, that are shaping the future one that will be defined by increasing challenges to growth as we have known it. Of course, such warnings need solutions, which is why he and Taggart published the manual Prosper, How to Prepare for the Future and Create a World Worth Inheriting. In addition to the analysis and commentary he writes for millions of readers at his site, peakprosperity.com, Chris's insights are in high demand by the media as well as academic, civic, private organizations around the world, including institutions such as the United Nations, the UK House of Commons, and US state legislators. Please share your feedback and thoughts with me on today's interview. You can let me know your thoughts on Twitter by tweeting me at MC Lobsher or by email at info at cashflowninja.com. Please remember to join our mailing list by signing up at cashflowninja.com or texting cashflowninja, one word, all capitalized, to four four. Two two two. That's two fours and three twos. As some of my listeners may know, I live in Newtown, Pennsylvania, a town that's about 45 minutes away from Philadelphia, the birthplace of the United States, the home of the cheesesteak, the Rocky Steps, and also the hometown of the beloved founding father, Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin believed that investment and knowledge pays the best interest, and early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. 
The Cashflow Ninja have aligned itself with partners that aims to empower you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Our healthy partner on it provides supplements, nutrient dense, and earth grown foods and fitness equipment to help you achieve your next level of well being and total human optimization. Our listeners can get a 10% discount with coupon code GET ON IT at Cashflow Ninja Health. Dot com. Our wealthy partner, Fundrise, gives everyone the opportunity to invest directly in high-quality real estate without the middleman. Fundrise makes the process of investing in the highest-quality commercial real estate from around the country simple, efficient, and transparent. You can get started with as little as $1,000 and do not have to be an accredited investor to participate in some of their offerings. You can check them out at Cashflow Ninja Wealth. Dot com. And don't forget our wise partner, Audible. You can download any audiobook for free when you try Audible for 30 days. You can download your free audiobook at CashflowNinjaBook.com. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to the Cashflow Ninja Podcast with your host, MC Lobsher. You must be prepared to ignite. Chris, welcome to the show. Why, it's a real pleasure to be here with you and your listeners today. Can you please share a little bit about your background and your journey and how you had that aha moment realizing that we were on a course right now that was unsustainable? Well, for me, I would love to tell you it was because I'm just such an awesome human. But uh, what happened was I was watching my portfolio get shredded in 2000, 2001. I'd done everything right. I'd gone to the right schools, worked my way up through the corporate ladder. I was putting all this money away. I was a genius investor like everybody in the 90s, and then I became an idiot. So I started looking into that, and the more I scratched at the economy, the more worried I became about uh, the direction of things. And then one thing led to another because I am a curious person, and I started connecting a a bunch of dots. And once I had put the economy uh, in, into uh, reference with the rest of the world, that's when I had my aha moment and I said, woo, this is unsustainable. And uh, I really lost interest in participating in, um, in, in my old job and needed to go out and find something more aligned with what I was uh, discovering. No, you had identified many warning signs regarding our monetary and financial systems, our energy resources, food and water supply, and our environment. Can you share some of these warning signs with my listeners? Well, the biggest warning sign of them all is that uh, our economy is really based on a money system that has to constantly grow. Well, it doesn't have to, but its two states seem to be uh, advancing nicely or threatening to collapse or actually collapsing. And that's the kind of money system we've got. There's lots of different money systems out there. We could be using alternative ones, but we're using a system of money where we loan our money into existence. And it's just a feature of this system that it's either expanding or collapsing. So that got me a little bit concerned. And I was, well, very concerned about um, uh, the astonishing ability of humans to put off for tomorrow what needs to be addressed today. And, you know, there, uh, whether I'm looking in the U.S. or more broadly across the globe, big demographic trends, pension and entitlement programs that are woefully out of step with those pensions and entitlement promises uh, that that politicians had zero interest in, in dealing with this. And I was just watching the predicament of unpayable promises. This is just within the economy itself, that first E, watching those just pile up and compound you know, people talk about the cash deficit of the United States being around four or five hundred billion right now, but the accrual based deficit, which any company would have to account for, is closer to three to five trillion dollars per year, depending on which year we're talking about. It's unpayable. It's going to have a date with destiny. We just don't know when, but it, it's coming. And that uh, you speak about the three E. So they're the um, you mentioned the economy, and the other two is energy and environment. Yeah, so this is the framework that that really, once I got this put into place, this changed my outlook on the world, what I do for work, uh, where I live, who my friends are, how we schooled our children. This this data had really big impact on me, and I chose to share it with the world in something called the, the crash course. And those three E's are the economy, energy, environment. Now, now, why do I have all three in one spot? Well, because nobody else was putting them in one spot. So our economic masters, the fiscal, 
uh, and monetary masters, you know, both on the government and the central bank side, were pulling all their levers thinking that, you know, the next 20 years would be just like the last 20 years. You just make money a little cheaper and people will borrow more and the economy comes roaring back. Um, maybe we'll deficit spend a little to get ourselves through a rough patch and then we'll, we'll kickstart the economy and it'll come back. Well, guess what? The global economy hasn't come back in 10 years. It's very much stuck in subpar growth. And I think to understand that, you not only have to understand the corrosive impact of the largest amount of debt ever in the system, but you have to wander with me over here to the world of resources, which is actually where growth comes from. So the most surprising thing for me to discover was really the extent to which energy is the master resource. If you've got it, you can have an economy. If you don't have energy, you really can't have one. Uh, and so so once I started studying where we are in this energy stories, and by we, I'm talking about the species on this planet, where we are in terms of 80% of our energy coming from fossil fuels, them being finite in quantity, but probably the most damaging statistic is that for every calorie of food that you or I eat or anybody listening, 10 calories of fossil fuels are hidden in that calorie. So farming is an upside down energy expensive uh, adventure for us. We've put 7.4 billion people on the planet with most of them eating fossil fuels, as it were. And we don't have a plan B. I haven't seen anybody in power yet say, here's how we're going to feed nine and a half billion people in 2050 when fossil fuels as in aggregate have peaked uh, maybe 10, 20 years in the rear view mirror by that time. It's a really big, giant thing. And uh, once I got that piece in view and I understood that we have a money system that has to grow infinitely forever and we have an energy system that can't because someday it, 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 it peaks, um, that started giving me some pause. But as well, the 30 in the story, the environment, you know, there I'm looking both at the resources we take out and the waste we put back in on both of those dimensions. We can clearly see that the people listening to this podcast today are those who are alive when humans as a species have to confront this idea that, hey, there's such a thing as limits, right? right. Not that these limits are, are, are a death sentence it, by any stretch, but they are something that needs to be looked at intelligently, rationally, prudently, and um, I do what I do because I find very few governments are, are, are at that level of, of awareness yet. Very, very interesting. And here we are at the end of uh, 2016. And, we, you know, t speaking about from an economic side in the markets, we're seeing all time highs. And in the United States, President elect Donald Trump um, was just elected in the 2016 election and he will have a Republican majority in the House and the Senate. What are you currently seeing out there as far as the economy and the markets and some of these coming changes that you've spoken about? Um, and what are you forecasting for 2017? Well, I've been a critic for a long time of this idea that um, money printed and dumped into financial markets is the same thing as actual prosperity. So I'm sure you, you've got sophisticated listeners. They're aware that, yes, uh, there's been a huge increase in financial asset prices, stocks, bonds across the world. Yes, central banks have targeted those with a little tail wags the dog sort of thinking, which is if we can drive up the price of assets, people will feel more confident, more confident people borrow some more, people who borrow more, consume more, that drives the economy. It, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a, a multi-pivot um, linkage that they're trying to engineer there. But what they've done is is dumped tens of trillions of dollars into the markets. They've gotten an extraordinary response from the financial markets. But what they haven't gotten is this, an equivalent response from the underlying economy, and in particular, from corporations, who instead of using this 0% free spigot of money to invest in R&D, property, plant, and equipment, other capital expenditures, have mostly engineered financial engineering as, as their response, right? So, you know, they borrow and then they buy back shares. Uh, yes, corporations have a lot of cash on the balance sheets, but please don't forget to look at the debt on the balance sheets, also at records. Um, so so this, this whole idea that central banks can engineer prosperity is a false idea. All central banks can do is create conditions where more money is available, and in particular, what the central banks have done is that they are a distributive set of organizations. They take from one and give to the other. They took from savers 
they gave to borrowers. They gave to banks by taking away from pensioners, in essence, right? So this has happened all across the globe, and they did that by driving interest rates down. So I'm looking at this uh, wild rally that we've got going on now, and I'm looking at this in the context of a very, very large uh, bubble that's been blowing for a while. It started in the late 80s, early – I'm sorry, late 70s, early 80s. And, and what I haven't seen is that next engine of growth come out. Now, I, I would be completely – as soon as I see a few things show up on the landscape – I'm going to have such a different point of view around all this, but I need to see like an, an astonishingly new battery technology come out that can help us um, with our energy predicament that we're facing. Or maybe, you know, thorium reactors actually get um, put to the front of the burner and we, we push those forward. But something that can fundamentally be the underpinning of the next leg of growth, I'm going to have to see. I haven't seen it. Um, so I'm looking for uh, a bit more muddling along. I'm taking less of a cue from financial asset prices at this stage because I consider them pretty distorted. And I'm trying to look at the underlying drivers of growth that can exist out there, uh, new technologies, uh, you know, resurgence of trade or other indicators that we've got, uh, more open trade, things like that. And the Trump presidency so far is shaping up to be, uh, uh, at least through his cabinet picks and his first overtures, say, with Taiwan and uh, uh, vis-a-vis the Chinese situation, uh, these don't look particularly um, favorable for uh, what we'll call like a, a, a more free uh, trade environment. I think uh, Trump's got a bit of the protectionist in him, and not that that's right or wrong, but I do think that that would be a negative against uh, more global trade at this point. Yeah, we certainly do have uh, some bubbles and artificial bubbles bl- being blown up. And, and now as we're going into this uh, predicament, as you've referred to it, um, and the next crisis could be on the way, you've uh, you've talked about several stages as you see this crisis potentially playing out, with part one being a deflationary one and part two progressing more into inflationary uh, uh, stage or having a more inflationary impact. Can you can you share a little bit of an overview of how you see this playing out? Well, a- absolutely. My view is that the first we're going to have to see some big deflation before we're going to see the next stage of this. Right now, we're seeing a continued inflation in financial assets. We're not seeing a lot of underlying structural inflation in any of the other base data, which, you know, inflation as people think of it, rising prices, right? So uh, food, fuel, uh, you know, clothes, things like that. But um, in truth, inflation is whenever you have rising prices of anything because more money is, is chasing those things. Right now we have massive inflation where the rich people who have first access to central banks, that's, that's what they're getting uh, is the money first. So where have we seen inflation? Well, you know, London um, trophy properties, New York, uh, pricey lofts. Uh, we've seen it in uh, diamonds, uh, larger the better, uh, art, Gulfstream, 550, 650. So, so in the places where the rich uh, spend their money, we've seen lots of inflation, um, plenty of it. But we are not going to see inflation back at the level – the, the central banks want to find it because the wage part of this dynamic has been broken for probably 15 years, maybe 20 now, and that's due to globalization and um, and the ability to offshore your manufacturing to wherever the labor is cheapest. And that's true pretty much everywhere. So without wages spiraling with prices, it's very hard to get the sort of inflation the central banks claim they want to see. So what are they doing? Well, they continue to pump up uh, financial markets, which is fine. It's well and good. It, it, it buys us time, but it's not solving the underlying structural impediments that would allow us, I think, to get out of the woods on, on this particular story. So um, first, I think in order to get out of the woods, we're going to have to see a deflation that scares the central banks and scares them enough that they come out of this QE mentality, which is quantitative easing, which both you know, Japan, uh, United States, EU, and UK all have been doing this uh, thing, which is to preferentially take central bank thin air money, electronically print it up, and hand it straight to the financial markets, buying um, bonds, primarily sovereign bonds, now corporate bonds in the EU, also equities, uh, Switzerland and, and Japan buying equities directly. So they're going to have to stop that, and they're going to have to give money to Main Street, Right. By that, I mean the somehow the central banks print up money and this time it comes to you and me and your listeners directly. Maybe it's a tax holiday. Maybe it's a check in the mail. I don't know. But they can't do that until they have 
political cover to take that next step. It's extreme. It'll be the next act in a very, very long set of uh, very highly interventionist, very experimental things that central banks have been trying. But I don't personally think they can do that without some mandate from a very scared populace and political class that can say, do it, please, anything, help us. Um, So that's what I'm looking for first is a big deflationary scare followed by money for Main Street. And that leads us to act three in this story, which is an actual inflationary event, um, which could be rather dramatic. Uh, to your point, once those checks uh, start showing up in, the, in, in your mailbox or deposited into your account at that stage from the government, it's going to be like a hot potato. Um, and people are going to run out and try and, and, and get rid of it and spend it because if it's just being thrown out, then, uh, you know, the, they, they'll realize that the money's in that sense basically worthless and they have to buy something of value with it. Absolutely. So, I mean, just to be clear, if the check is for 100 bucks, I'm not going to advise anybody to do anything. But if it's 10,000, 30,000, 50,000, uh, walk, don't walk, run and go buy stuff, right? That just if it's not nailed down or even if it is, just get rid of the money will be how people will be interpreting this because this is what governments have tried many times in the past, which is a, they experience some giant fundamental mismatch between their outstanding liabilities and their actual revenue streams, and they try and print the difference. Uh, That has not worked out well in any example I'm aware of yet. Uh, It's the same old story. It's just humans being humans, which is how can we avoid having to say hard words to to the people who who put me in office and uh, instead try something that, that feels good in the moment, and that's money printing. So look, we've seen an extraordinary amount of money printing up to this point. Here we are. We are in late 2016. I see nothing to suggest that we're not going to see more of that as we go forward. And that makes it hard to analyze or rationalize things on a fundamental basis. It's very hard to keep your bearings when money is is, uh, just being printed and thrown at stuff. Um, But that's the essence of of living uh, in in a monetary system that's kind of been mismanaged and we could say is a little maybe closer to the end of its life than the beginning of its life. You know, I don't want to say stuff all ends tomorrow, but um, by any stretch, uh, there's a, I think there's a lot of time left in this story, but we're playing it the same way we've played it before, making the same mistakes we've made before. And that's just something people should be alert to, you know, even if they dismiss it and say, I've analyzed that, I disagree, that's fine. But I'm, my work in the world is to help people understand that broader context, because let me be honest, the more I, I watch something like CNBC or read the Wall Street Journal, the less of this context I actually have. It, it's very confusing, I think, to try and understand where the world's going uh, from the news of the day. It, you have to step back and understand the big stuff. How is money created? Who's creating it? Where does it go? For whatever reasons, our financial press spends n- almost no time debating or exploring those questions. I think they're the most important ones. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And I've covered the Federal Reserve, the monetary system on this podcast before because you really have to understand how this game is being played in order to position yourself uh, to prosper within this game with a specific set of rules. And one of the things I think that is extremely important that you've touched upon is actually realizing what wealth is and real wealth. Now, you've mentioned different sources of wealth and more specific, as you call them, capital. Can you share these different forms um, of wealth and sources of capital with my listeners? Well, absolutely. Love to. So so from the let's start at the at the outer edge of this, which is that. Um, when I say or you say wealth, a lot of people immediately think currency, you know, whatever your local currency is. You think, you know, pounds, euros, dollars, yen, something, um, or how many of those currency units you hold. Uh, to me, there's there's three layers of wealth. There's primary wealth, which is the land. It's the raw materials out of which, you know, we can fashion things that have Uh, other values of wealth for us. So that's primary wealth. Secondary wealth is when humans uh, take the primary wealth, which might be a thick stand of trees, that's primary. Secondary, hey, we've got a a lumber mill and we saw it up and we turned it into boards. Um, That secondary wealth is the means of production. And it's also the things that we've converted into useful things. It's food, it's, it's, it's shelter, it's clothes, things like that. Tertiary wealth in this story are just claims on the first two. It's money, it's debt, it's bonds, it's derivatives, it's things like that. So with that understanding, um, there are, you know, I just, to me, real wealth 
is primary and secondary. Everything else is a claim on real wealth, which I illustrate by saying, look, if you're on an island and you have a billion dollars in a pallet uh, uh, right there in hard currency, or there's a pallet of food, you know which has more value to you in that moment, what, what the real source of wealth is. The pallet of currency has value if and only if you can convert it into something. So the reason this is important is that the world's resources are st- and economic growth is flattening out, but the claims are still continuing to go up exponentially, which we're seeing right now in the equity markets, but we're still seeing it in the debt markets. It's extraordinary. So the claims are growing faster and faster and faster. And if people just understood that those claims are meaningless, unless they point to real wealth, then you have an understanding of, of what I mean by um, what's coming, which is a wealth transfer. So that's part one. So let's just be clear about it. There's markers and claims for wealth, and then there's actual wealth. Now, given that you and I and anybody listening can't do anything about monetary policy, I can't prevent the central banks from printing and dumping more money in the financial markets. Nothing I can do about that. What I can do is understand, though, that I can control what I can control. So financial capital, very important. People should absolutely manage it, um, understand it, uh, work with it, uh, treat it as, as something that they want to safeguard as carefully as they can. Absolutely. Financial capital is important, but it's not the only form of capital. There's seven other forms that if you are rich in all these forms of capital, I would say you are having a prosperous, happy, healthy, well-connected, and satisfying life right now. And you'll be more well positioned to weather any future shocks. So if you're rich in all these forms of capital, you are resilient. So here's a couple other examples. Your social capital, really important. You know, I when I hold these uh, weekend long seminars and people come and sometimes, you know, there's a husband and a wife and, and it's, you'd be surprised, it's kind of split. One or the other of them is often very concerned about where they live or their money and they want to make these drastic changes. And sometimes those changes mean, moving away from where they are. And what that does is it diminishes the importance and the value of the social capital that the other um, married part of this partnership probably has more invested in and, and really values highly. And the truth is that, yes, protecting your financial capital is important, your social capital, incredibly important, right? So if you want to really build and deepen the number of people you know, how well you know them, you know, way beyond just who they are, what they do, you know, the simple sort of, you know, LinkedIn headline uh, sort of variables about someone, but really getting to know people so you can trust them and be vulnerable with them, that this is an extraordinarily valuable thing to have in your life today. But we've seen from all the places like in Venezuela right now or Zimbabwe or other places that have experienced real hardship or the United States in the Great Depression or uh, any place that gets economically whacked, that who you know and how well you know them are as big a determinant of your happiness and ability to thrive as anything else that you can you can name. So uh, we advise people to yeah, build your social capital up. Um, your living capital is another form. That's the health of your own body. And this is the uh, state of the ecosystem around you. So in my personal case, if I spin around and look out of my office, I can see the garden and orchard that I've been tending for a while, just, you know, on my suburban plot, but building the soil up and planting things that will attract more pollinators. So a very bee friendly, butterfly friendly sort of yard out there. Um, And is my living capital is really important to me, both um, for my current happiness and quality of life, but also potentially for some futures. So those are just three examples um, out of eight. I don't know if you really want to, to, to trundle through all eight, but uh, these are the um, beginning set of, of these forms of capital. And so just based on these three examples, if if your money is, is safeguarded and, and uh, you're sleeping well because you know it's being managed appropriately given the risks today and you have your health and you've got good living capital around you and you've got a rich network of friends, I don't know how you lose in that story, but that's sort of the direction I've been going in because – there's large, uncontrollable things occurring in the world, which I can't do anything about. So I'm starting with what I can do something about. 
No, and I like that approach, too, because in your new book, Prosper, first in Crash Course, you identify this and also give so provide some actionable solutions. But in Prosper, you outline and share principles of what to do to prosper and improve your, your destiny. Now, you talk a lot about being resilient, and you just touched upon that, too, and uh, that we have to be resilient in order to prosper. What does being resilient mean to you? Well, the definition of resilient is the ability to um, rebound from some sort of an insult or injury. So I, I really think being resilient is is going to be one of the catchwords as we go forward. Companies can be resilient. Countries can be resilient. Families, individuals can be resilient. And to be resilient is a little bit – it's kind of how nature um, has taught us is is the way to, to really weather whatever storms are coming you know, it's better if you lay 12 eggs in a nest instead of one every other year. You know, the, the resilient species are those that um, uh, have multiple eggs, multiple ways of doing things. So if I'm, if I'm resilient, I probably have depth in all eight forms of capital. And, um, you know, I could lose or be diminished in any one of those and, and I'll still be okay. Uh, here's an example. I work with a lot of very wealthy people. I speak at wealth conferences. I talk with people whose families um, have billions. And uh, the simple truth is that none are so poor as those who only have money. I mean, these families have tons of resources, but in some cases, their entire identity is wrapped around this one form of capital. Their fortunes live and breathe, rise and die, uh, depending on this one thing. And that in some of these families, if they lost all of their capital, they would have nothing left. Because they haven't developed any other skills. They haven't broadened themselves. They're not resilient in any of these other areas. They have all their eggs in that one basket. Uh, so to me, resilience is the ability to weather these shocks and these storms as they go forward. And, you know, let's be clear. I think there's some coming. I think, you know, there's there's always the possibility for a another war to break out at some point in time. Oil supply pipelines could get cut. Who knows what could happen but very few individuals and companies are actually ready for this because they're existing in a very thin um, uh, sort of a landscape where, you know, some companies, they have 30,000 mile long supply chains. And if the big, you know, brown truck of happiness is rolling up with component parts each Monday, they can continue. Uh, but they don't have deep inventories. They don't have um, an ability to control what happens across the supply chains. And, and so as long as everything is working well, these are profitable uh, uh, cost-effective companies. But as soon as we get a hiccup anywhere in this, uh, that story changes quickly. And I don't know when these stories going to change. I will tell you that all I can do, because these are all complex systems. Here's two things scientists know about complex systems. One, they owe all of their order and complexity to the continued flow of energy or resources through them. Right. So anything pinches off that flow of energy or resources, the complexity shrinks, which is a euphemism for saying collapses in some cases or, or, or you know, uh, companies go out of business. And two, you can't predict what's going to happen when. Right. A, a, an earthquake fault zone is a complex system. We study them intensively. We'd love to be able to predict exactly when and how big the next earthquake will be. Defies us completely, even with the best supercomputers. We can't figure that out. Um, but what we can tell you is that if an earthquake is supposed to slip every 10 years, if a fault is supposed to slip every 10 years and result in an earthquake, uh, and it hasn't given way for 20 years, that the risk is now higher, that we're going to have both an earthquake coming sooner than later, and also it'll be larger uh, than usual. So what we can do is track the risk factors. So how do I tie this in? Well, in 2008, we had this earthquake, the fault gave way, um, and what we should have done was noticed what really drove that. And instead of really dealing with the structural things that underlay that particular earthquake we experienced, we doubled down on it. Um, and so if we ask the question today, is sovereign debt higher or lower than in 2008? Well, it's kind of higher. Um, are the two big to fail banks uh, larger or smaller? <laughs> they're, all, they're all larger, right? Um, you know, on and on and on down this list. And each one of those represents a risk factor to me. And I'm just cataloging those. It's the best I can do. And I can say, the risks seem to be accumulating, not abating. We have larger structural imbalances, whether those are the target two imbalances across Europe or it's the trade imbalances across China and the US and the rest of the world, or whether it's the extraordinary imbalance between um, a dwindling population in Japan and ever increasing amounts of indebtedness of the nation. These all represent imbalances that, that are, are, are as if 
um, we're sitting on a very active or used, should be active uh, earthquake fault line, and it's it hasn't given way. And this is something that, what can I tell you? You know, I go out and poll people informally because I, this is very hard to quantify. But qualitatively, I can tell you that even though we have stock markets at all-time highs, the amount of nervousness and disbelief and discomfort that I'm uh, recording out there among people poor and extraordinarily rich is as high as it's ever been. I I would agree with you on that too. That's the same that I'm seeing in the people that I speak to as well. It's it, I have the same uh, conclusion on that. Yeah. What, why do you know? Let me flip this. Ask you a question, if I could. Why do you think there have people been able to articulate the source of that discomfort? I think that what uh, what is being communicated to me is that a lot of people look at the the overall picture and they see that nothing has really been changed drastically to make structural changes to uh, the economy and the and the and the markets. It's as you mentioned some of the 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 bad uh, trends that exists and data that exists is only for instance the the bit too big to fails just got even bigger. Um, the, the debt has just gotten bigger. So none of the structural changes or anything has changed. So everybody is extremely skeptical just by looking at it right now and saying, well, you know, it, this hasn't been fixed. It, it's just it's just been it's a bubble that's being blown up again. Well, absolutely. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. And of course, we should all be nervous about bubbles because well, this will be the third monster one in 15 years. Um, so. So yes, uh, it is a little bit unbelievable when you know the uh, European Central Bank is tossing 85 billion euros a month uh, into the into the bond market, and then um, and then coming around and saying they're not responsible for for any wealth disparities or the plight of the uh, savers. It's just it's just uh, cognitive dissonance to try and hold what they're saying and what they're doing in the same spot in your brain. And there's such a disconnect, uh, what I'm seeing too, as you mentioned, that what's reported on the TV, the media has completely uh, lost the plot, in my opinion. <laughs> so um, so the average person sees that the markets are at all-time highs, but they see that their neighbor is still out of work, potentially, or the, their own living standard has gone down, this living standard of their neighbor has gone down. Um, their neighborhood as a whole isn't uh, isn't prosperous or has raised their living standard of living. So I think then they become really skeptical and saying, well, wait a second, what is going on here? And that leads to, um, you know, this underlining anger, that kind of an or resentment, that kind of uh, bubble to the surface in the last couple of months during the election. Oh, absolutely. Whether it's the Italian referendum where they voted no and Renzi was out or it's Brexit or it's Trump or a variety of other things we see bubbling under, all completely understandable if you drop the, the typical narrative and understand that for the people who are doing the voting in this case, their lives have gotten measurably, quantitatively worse and more economically difficult over the past 10 to 20 years, depending on where we're talking about. And that, of course, creates some social tension, and it's only made worse by a media that pretends and lectures these same people as saying, if you're experiencing difficulty, it must be in your head. Maybe maybe you should train for a different job, or pretending as if somehow this is this is the fault of, of the people who are voting rather than, than a structural thing, which is that the system is designed to vacuum money away from the many and give it to the few, and it's now in overdrive. And that creates a sense of unfairness. And guess what? We're primates. We don't like that. It just doesn't work out. So, yeah, that anger is building. And it's been a real mystery to watch the elites in my country, in the United States, um, uh, almost look like they were going to do a little soul searching post Trump. But now they seem to have solidified around this idea of, of um, really turning up the world. It's sort of saying this was Russia's fault. That's why we lost. It wasn't due to any failure on our part to understand or or be sympathetic to the vast majority of the people in this country. And and so, as you said, yeah, I feel like they've really lost the plot. Yeah, and, and doubling down to your point, it's the same with Brexit. Um, instead of taking a step back and saying, 
why was why did people vote this way why are the majority of people feeling this way and try to understand the psyche and what is going on um they're still running with their own story and just doubling doubling it down saying you know with uh, in the united states the russia version so a core message in our show is to leave our families and communities and the world better than we found it by passing down a mindset values and principles to future generations not just money so if you cannot pass on any money to future generations and we're only allowed to pass on three principles to them to build wealth and achieve happiness and success what would they be oh well uh this is a, a big subject, and you know the mission of of my company is to create a world worth inheriting. Uh, big, big, hairy ass mission, but you need those. Um, and the ways that we do that is, is um, first, people really need to educate themselves. It's it's sometimes troubling to encounter all this information, but the first step to freedom is you have to understand, as you said, what are the rules of the game, and the rules are are usually not taught. So there are resources out there to try and understand the context of the larger game. Once you can see that, now you have some chance to maneuver within that. Number two, uh, everybody should really be thinking about um, creating multiple streams of income for themselves. This is just economically. So entrepreneurial, very important. Even if you've got a job with a paycheck, try and find other ways of either A, bringing cash in, or B, figuring out how to have less cash going out the door. Entrepreneurial spirit, very big. And then the third piece that I would really counsel people is, is look, none of this matters until or unless um, you have the right mental framework, the right emotional state uh, to really manage this. And so emotional capital, a form we didn't talk about yet, is one that I increasingly believe is the most important one out there. Attitude determines everything. And, uh, you know, as a quick example, you could have all the money in the world, but if you are so mentally unresilient that you feel the need to engage in heavy drinking or opiate prescription abuse or whatever that is, um, you're, you're very much not going to be happy. So that emotional capital is essential to happiness. Look, none of this is, uh, if anybody comes to my site and says, wow, this stuff just depresses me or I don't like thinking about this, then it's not right for you. The, the purpose of the work I'm doing is if people at the end of the day are more connected and more alive, then this has been worth it, right? So that's really how I approach all of this is, yeah, there's some troubling stuff to learn, but once you pop through, this is really an invitation to bring your best gifts to the world and to actually live on your own terms rather than some marketer's terms. And the work that uh, you've been doing is amazing. I've stu studied it. It's uh, it's really been enlightening and provides a ton of value. Um, how can my listeners uh, learn more about you, your company, and just stay informed of all of the projects that you're involved with? Well, the number one and best way is uh, through peakprosperity.com. That's P-E-A-K, like a mountain peak, prosperity.com. At large community there, you can find uh, the video series called The Crash Course. There's a book version of The Crash Course as well as Prosper on Amazon, also at the website, uh, and uh, uh, on the, all the usual places, Twitter, Facebook, uh, like that. Just Chris Martinson will, will help you find all of those uh, on any social media outlet. So that's, that's what we're up to, and that's what we do. And um, I would love to uh, engage any of your listeners at the website and um, in our conversations. Fantastic. Well, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey and your knowledge around all these topics and providing a ton of value for my listeners. This has been a fantastic experience and had a blast having you on. Well, thank you very much. The pleasure has been mine. Hi, this is MC Lobsher, the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast. As you may know, I'm also the president and chief wealth strategist of Valhalla Wealth Financial. We help individuals, families, small businesses, entrepreneurs, and professionals build their wealth outside of Wall Street and help investors maximize the use of every dollar in their personal economy and boost their investment gains. We do this by combining their capital and investments with the financial vehicle of the wealthy, according to the infinite banking concept. If you are interested in learning more, you can email me at info at cashflowninja.com and I will send you a copy of Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. 
Thank you for joining my guest, Chris Martinson, and myself on the Cashflow Ninja podcast today. If you like what you hear and appreciate what we're trying to build here at the Cashflow Ninja, please subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes, and share our show with family, friends, and your network. I really have been humbled by your support and feedback, and if there's any way that I can provide more value to you and serve you better, please reach out to me at info at cashflowninja.com. Don't forget to take advantage of the offers from our partners that aims to empower you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Our healthy partner, Onnit, provides supplements, nutrients, and earth-grown foods and fitness equipment to help you achieve your next level of well-being and total human optimization. Our listeners can get a 10% discount with coupon code GETONIT at CashflowNinjaHealth.com. Our wealthy partner, Fundrise, gives everyone the opportunity to invest directly in high-quality real estate without the middleman. Fundrise makes the process of investing in the highest quality commercial real estate from around the country simple, efficient, and transparent. You can get started with as little as $1,000 and do not have to be an accredited investor to participate in some of their offerings. You can check them out at CashflowNinjaWealth.com. And don't forget our wise partner, Audible. You can download any audiobook for free when you try Audible for 30 days. You can download your free audiobook at CashflowNinjaBook.com. That's our show for today, everyone. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. You have been listening to the Cashflow Ninja with your host, MC Laubscher. The podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Today's show notes and resources are available on our website, CashflowNinja.com. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objective, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.